So one of the things from your blog is, you know, I was reading a post about your birthday and you said one of your friends texted you and said, you're one of my few friends who gets, just get shit done. So <laughs> what do you think allows you to just get shit done? I'm writing that book right now, actually. That is the current book I'm writing. I think, you know, it's the hardest question for me to answer, which is why I'm writing a book about it. But I guess if I had to divide it into parts, one is the understanding about the finite nature of time, which nobody really seems to understand in my mind. When I was 21, I had a gun put to my head in a robbery and the trigger was pulled several times. And I was convinced that I was dying that night, like 100%. And it left me with a lifetime of PTSD, but it also left me with a keen understanding of what regret feels like and how, how, how close we are to not being here anymore. And that was the night that sort of changed everything for me. So the decision-making process that I go through every day is not what do I want to do today, but what does the 100-year-old version of me want me to do today? Because if it was just me, if I was just deciding how do I want to spend my day, it'd be like cheeseburgers, ice cream, and sex. Like every single day would just be those things, right? But, and that would be delightful for that particular day. But when I get to a hundred, I'm going to be a little disappointed about how I spent my time. So I'm always thinking about what does that person in the future want me to do? How does that person want me to spend my day? I don't trust myself in the moment. I don't trust those in the moment decisions. It doesn't mean that in the moment stops mattering. The 100 year old version of me says that if Charlie, my son wants to play, when I'm supposed to be writing, I always play because there's going to be mm. a day when he stops asking. There's a reason why we watched The Simpsons at seven o'clock this morning because he came downstairs and said, I really want to watch another episode of The Simpsons. And I had finished my blog post. I was working on my book. I really should have kept working on my book. But I said, yeah, let's watch The Simpsons, man. That's going to be great. So it doesn't mean I'm sort of like hyper-focused on just accomplishing things, but I'm hyper-focused on using every minute of my day to the best possible effect to make to make me happy about the legacy I'm creating. So that's the first part, understanding that. And as much as I can say that to people, I don't know how often they really believe it. And then the second thing is sort of just structuring your life so that you can get the most done. And oddly, I think that McDonald's has helped me do that. I was a manager of McDonald's for 10 years while I was going through college and, and through other terrible moments in my life. And there was a day when my wife and I were watching the movie Croc which is about Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. And he was creating this system in the kitchen where everyone's movement was reduced to the smallest possible movement possible to produce mm -hmm. the most number of cheeseburgers. And that's how McDonald's works. And he was doing this thing in the kitchen and my wife paused the movie and she said, is that why you are who you are? <laughs> and I thought that might be one of the reasons. Cause once I find the fastest way to do something I just do it that way every single time. You know, and I try to find the fastest way to do everything. So everything from like emptying the dishwasher to folding laundry to taking the shortest route to get to a place. And I run across parking lots, you know, because I feel like why would I walk into the grocery store when I can jog into the grocery store? Because that will be good for me and it will decrease the amount of time I have to spend. You know, I know the layout of the grocery store. I go to one grocery store, not eight. There's one. I know where every single thing in that grocery store is. I know what aisle it's in. So I'm the fastest grocery shopper, which was great during the pandemic. You know, during the pandemic, I, I time myself in grocery stores. I'm like the best I've ever done right now for a full grocery load. My best is 22 minutes and like 12 seconds for a, for a full, like one week, one week. Do you load. keep and a spreadsheet? No, I have it in Evernote actually. <laughs> but I sort of just believe in the idea that we have to do a lot of things in life and a lot of them really aren't very rewarding. And if we focused on how to shorten those unrewarding tasks to the shortest possible time, we have more time, you know, and sleep, I think is the most important one of all of them. Cause people always say you mustn't sleep much, you know, and I sleep five to six hours a night, which I know is not a lot by comparison to a lot of people, but I also argue that people never take their sleep seriously. So when I get into a bed, you know, you can ask my wife 30 seconds after I'm in bed, I am asleep and I do not wake up until it is time to wake up. And I often don't wake up with an alarm. I wake up just my eyes open right around 4.30 and I get out of bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because I take sleep seriously. So when, I, when people say, what does that mean? I always say, well, first of all, you can't do anything in bed except sleep. So if you're looking at your phone, you're reading a book, you're watching TV, you've now treated sleep like it's nothing because you have to train your body that when I lie down in this bed, my only job is to sleep. So if you're doing any of those other things, you're not treating sleep properly. That's why you're probably not falling asleep as quickly as you can. And you're not entering that deep REM sleep as quickly as you could. 
so that I'm probably in more REM sleep than most people, even though I'm in bed less than most people. I use a sound machine, a white noise machine. If you're not using that, you're not even trying. The reason I'm able to sleep all night and not wake up is because there's a white noise machine. So any, the howling of the wind, you know, the cat meowing, all of those things get lost in the white noise. So I don't wake up. So I don't have to re-enter REM sleep and waste time like that. You know, and then the snooze button, if anyone's using the snooze button, I mean, that's just scientifically, it's the worst thing you can do to yourself. If you go to bed every night at about the same time, you will wake up every morning at about the same time. And you will often not need an alarm, which is the best way to wake up, which is just your body gradually understands it's four o'clock. I'm going to start releasing chemicals so that around 4.30, he opens his eyes. And the moment I open my eyes, I jump out of bed because I'm so excited about the day. Like, I don't understand why people want to spend time in bed because it doesn't seem like a very entertaining place. It's just, it's, I hate going to sleep. It's my least favorite part of the day. My wife, it makes my wife crazy because she loves to sleep and I get it. You know, there is a time when you want to just let things go and, you know, empty your mind. But for me, every time I get into bed, I'm like, stupid sleep. I hate this. I got to lie here for six hours now and like, just do nothing and maybe battle PTSD nightmares, you know, like it's just no fun. So, so a lot of those decisions go into helping me get a lot done. Mm. Did you say three things? Did I mishear you? Um, It's always valuing time, understanding the value of time. Oh yes, it is. And then the second one is sort of like, like constructing a life so that the tasks you have to complete, whether it's sleep or the grocery store is done as, shortly as possible. And then the third one is goal setting. Mm. The idea that you're going to set some goals for yourself. You're going to hold yourself accountable in whatever way you feel is appropriate. For me, I post my goals on my blog at the beginning of the year. I repost them at the beginning of every month and I report on my progress. And that you set goals that are high enough so that you never actually achieve all of them. You know, I tell people, if I, I, I think I have 52 goals this year that I have listed on my blog that I'm tracking the progress on. I've never reached 100%. The closest I got was 88%, but my average over 12 years is like 60%. You know, when people say 60%, that's like a D. And I say, well, if I hit 100%, that's a fail because mm. I haven't stretched myself. I want to set enough goals that I'm going to fail. You have to, we have to embrace failure as a part of success. We have to mm-hmm. embrace failure as, as part of goal setting and goals, goal achieving. So you have to know the direction you're going in. You have to know what you actually want to accomplish because if you're doing all these things, but you don't actually sort of set a horizon that you're that you're heading towards, then you're going to sort of be aimless and shiftless and probably watch all the episodes of The Simpsons, you know, over two weeks rather than what I'm doing is like one or two a day with my son. 